But Carlo had a leg up on other gangsters of his generation. His American relatives, already members of New York's bustling underworld, rented him a small apartment near the Brooklyn waterfront. They wasted no time in introducing Carlo to the rackets. It was the era of prohibition, and the public was thirsty for illegal booze. All over America, organized crime was supplying it and reaping the profits. Some of New York's busiest bootleggers were Carlo's first cousins, the Castellanos. The Castellano family had a, a small trucking business. The truck naturally, like so many other small trucking businesses, was used to transport booze. So he became, in effect, a rum runner. And Gambino was both a driver and sometimes he would serve as a shotgun because different uh, bootleg guys used to hijack each other's trucks. In his new criminal career, Carlo met one of the local mafia leaders, Joe the Boss Masseria. This old-time Sicilian man of respect ran a big bootlegging racket. Carlo, sensing an opportunity to move ahead, went to work for Masseria. Carlo was just a very acute businessman and uh, organizer, and he soon became indispensable to whoever he was working for. But Gambino was treacherous at heart. He knew that clinging to a single boss could mark him for death by a rival gang. Besides, his own driving ambition left no room for lasting loyalty to anyone, including Joe the boss. In the early 1930s, Carlo's boss was locked in a bloody turf war with a longtime Sicilian rival named Salvatore Maranzano. The younger gangsters, including Carlo, thought the battle was tearing the mafia apart. One of Carlo's friends, Lucky Luciano, devised a clever plan to eliminate the boss. Lucky told Carlo about it and made him an offer. And Charlie Lucky said, look, well, you got an option. You can come with us, and we're going to be the winning side. This was a war that was going on. Carlo the Fox quietly supported Lucky's plan. In doing so, he positioned himself for future leadership with little personal risk. Carlo's motivation became uh, the motivation of practically everybody in those days. Get as rich as you can, as fast as you can and don't worry about all the old rules and uh, codes of the Sicilian Mafia. On April 15, 1931, Luciano invited Masseria to lunch at a Coney Island restaurant. As Lucky excused himself from the table, four gunmen walked in and put an end to Joe the boss. With the murder of Masseria, a number of his men, including Carlo Gambino, joined forces with the new boss, Salvatore Maranzano, but not for long. Maranzano was very happy to have these really smart, bright young thugs working for him. What Maranzano didn't realize is that those bright young thugs were plotting his murder so they could take over everything. And that's what they did. On orders from Charlie Lucky, Maranzano was shot and stabbed to death in his office. A new generation, led by Luciano, was now in charge, and Carlo had played his cards just right. Cards being dealt by Carlo's friend Luciano, who turned the underworld into a corporation, with each major gang getting a vote on the board of directors. Carlo was assigned to the boss who controlled the Brooklyn waterfront, Vincent Mangano. From there, Carlo began plotting a course to create his own criminal empire. Under Mangano, Gambino learned to run a variety of mob rackets, ranging from loan sharking to numbers to cargo theft. He was a good earner for the mob and therefore entitled to respect. And the bottom line in any mafia endeavor, whatever it is, is how much money do you make? Profit is of the supreme importance. Carlo's knack for business soon paid off. Just 29 years old, he earned a promotion to capo, or captain, in charge of his own crew. One of the first men he chose for the crew was his teenage cousin, Paul Castellano. The son of a Brooklyn numbers runner, Paul was also born into organized crime. Carlo, having learned firsthand how mafia wars are waged, knew that a mobster should be wary of his underlings. And he knew he could trust Paul, a blood relative. The less time Gambino spent watching his back, the 
the more time he could devote to planning his rise to power. He only really trusted the people who had been with him all his life. And he built up this little wall where nobody could get in who wasn't a blood relative. Blood ties would be of the highest significance to Karloff throughout his life. Some would say too significant. In 1932, at the age of 30, he solidified his bond with the Castellano family when he took the unorthodox step of marrying Paul Castellano's sister, Catherine. It was amazing that uh, Carlo Gambino married uh, Catherine Castellano because she was his first cousin. And as a good Catholic, you're not supposed to do that. But the Castellanos were extremely powerful in the Mafia. He multiplied his power, and that's what he was after. Carlo and Catherine settled into a modest Brooklyn row house. Together they raised three sons and a daughter. 